All right, welcome back to Abstract Algebra. I'm getting a head start making videos for lectures so that I can figure out other details when I go back to the office on Monday. Uh, I'll have a f maybe a few of these to go ahead and upload. Um, as I explained in the email, I don't yet know how we're going to deal with exams or, or grades overall. Um, I have a tentative plan for quizzes, or not quizzes, for, for the homework grades. Um, but I'll figure that out and, and send a more formal syllabus update a little bit later. Um, but for now, let's just press on with the material for the course. Um, my plan under normal circumstances would be to cover um, several sections from part three of the textbook over rings. Um, we'll see what we can get through. Um, but it'll be, whatever it is, it'll, it'll be enough. All right, so let's get started. Uh, so like I explained before the break, um, this remaining section of the course is over ring theory. It's basically starting from scratch with a new type of definition of, of a structure. We, we've been talking about group theory. Ring theory is very similar, or at least in many respects, it's very similar. Um, so a lot of it will be revisiting some of the same ideas from group theory. And so hopefully it, it's easier conceptually than what we've been talking about more recently. Um, so let's begin today with, or today with this uh, video over definition and basic examples of rings. And then later we will get into properties of rings. Uh, so let's start with the main definition. A ring is a set, we'll call it R, capital R. This is not the same bold faced R that we use for the real numbers, but it's a set R with two, two binary operations. I'll say operations in the interest of space, but binary operations, meaning they take two elements, combine them to give a new element that's also in the set. So two operations, we'll call them plus and multiplication, which I'll use a dot for, um, satisfying a collection of conditions. Uh, let's see. So I think when I the way I number these usually there should be seven conditions. So there's two operations. So there's more more properties that have to be satisfied. Um, for all of these, so I don't have to keep repeating it. I'm going to need a total of three letters to to deal with to, to represent elements of our ring. So for any A, B, and C in the in the set R, we have the following. Um, so the first condition is let's do it like this: A plus B. So that's a, bi a plus is a binary operation. So if I take two elements at a time, I can add them together. That gives me some new element. If I add that to C. So A plus B parentheses plus C, that's the same thing as A plus B plus C. I can already see, I can, I, I'm not gonna be able to fit all seven of these properties on the board at the same time. Uh, so I'll try to get four of them and talk about those by themselves. Um, but the first property is just the associative property for addition. The second property is there exists a special element, which is the which is an identity element for addition. So we call this element zero, but it's not necessarily the number zero because depending on our, our set, we might we might be dealing with numbers, we might be dealing with matrices, we might be dealing with more abstract things. 
So let me, to distinguish this from the number zero, let's call it zero sub r. If it's clear from context what, what we're dealing with, we, we can suppress the subscript there. But there exists an element zero sub r in the set r such that adding zero doesn't affect anything. So such that a plus zero equals a and let me leave it there one of my properties spoiling a couple properties down the line here one of the properties is going to be addition is commutative so i could say zero plus a equals a but i don't need to because that'll be uh, directly implied by property four when i get there all right uh, so we have an identity element for, for addition um Then also an element A has an inverse under addition. Let me just go ahead and say there exists an element which we call minus A in the ring such that adding it to A, so A plus minus A equals the zero element. Um, so, so far, under just we haven't said anything about multiplication yet. These are all uh, all properties of addition. What these three properties tell us is that under addition, under the under the operation of addition, this set R is a group. We, the group con, the group axioms were associativity of of the operation, the existence of an identity element for the operation and the existence of inverses for the operation. And when we're dealing with additive notation, inverse was negative notation, minus notation. Okay, and so by the way, a plus negative a, I can rewrite that as a minus a. Subtraction is adding an inverse under, under addition. <clears throat> All right, so the next, the next uh, requirement is associate, I'm oh, sorry, commutativity, commutativity. So a plus b is the same thing as b plus a. Okay, so with this, then I can get away with being lazy with my statements on two and three. Um, so addition is commutative, meaning order of addition doesn't matter. And so if we take all four of these, all four of these requirements together, it says that under addition. The set R is an abelian group. It's a group from the first three, and now it's also an abelian group under addition by the, the fourth property. Okay, so let's erase these. I'll, I'll keep the initial stuff. But those first four can be summarized. I'll write it down. as just a single uh, single statement. R with only addition is an abelian group. So that, that's the short way of summarizing those first four conditions. So now Let's go on to the other conditions. We have to have a few things be true about multiplication. Uh, the first is A times B times C is the same thing as A times B times C. So with the parentheses there. So we have, we have associativity for multiplication. Okay, we don't have the other, other three properties for multiplication that we had for addition. So we do not have an identity element for multiplication necessarily. We do not have uh, inverses for multiplication. And we don't have commutativity for multiplication. We might have those things, but we, we don't have them in general. 
the other two properties are about the interaction between addition and multiplication. So these are our distributive properties, which would say, um, there's two of them, A times B plus C is the same thing as A times B plus A times C. And so the order of multiplication matters. So if A is being multiplied in the front here, it's multiplied on the front on both of these two terms. So property seven or requirement seven is the same thing, but with the multiplication on the right side. So if I have A plus B, parentheses, times C, I can distribute that C to both A and B, but it has to be distributed on the right. So it's A times C plus B times C. All right, so a ring is any set with these two operations, with two operations which we call addition and multiplication. They don't have to be the usual multiplication and addition. They can be specialized operations for whatever the set is. But the two operations that we're calling plus and times have to satisfy these seven requirements. And if they do, you have what's called a ring. Um, a couple comments here. Um, depending on what textbook, you, so the definition I gave you here is, is in agreement with the definition in our textbook. There are other textbooks out there that have slight variations in what the definition of a ring is. Um, so if you go out looking for other resources, you might see definitions that contradict some of the things I'm saying. Um, and so in that case, you have to be careful with exactly how theorems are stated. Um, I'll, I'll clarify a little bit as we, as we go uh, what some of the other definitions might be. But let's uh, let me make a couple other comments here. So, a couple notes: in a ring, multiplication does not have to be commutative. So multiplication does not have to commute means A times B is not necessarily the same thing as B times A for some A and B, for certain A's, A's and B's. It might be true for specific A's and B's, uh, but it might, if, if it doesn't hold overall, then multiplication cannot be treated as commutative. Uh, however, if for any A and B, in the ring, A times B does equal B times A. So for example, the integers will be one of the first examples we talk about. The integers, obviously multiplication commutes. So in that situation, R is called, so I always, I always say that ring theory is, is a wasteland of definitions. There will be lots of definitions in, in ring theory. Um, as usual, I'm not expecting you to necessarily memorize the definitions, um, but we do need to talk about them. If multiplication is commutative, R is called a commutative ring. Commutative ring is probably the better way of saying that. So since addition is always commutative, when we specifically say the ring is commutative, that, that, that's not talking about addition. It has to be talking about multiplication. All right. Let me write one of these one at a time. So that's the first comment is, is if we throw in this additional property that multiplication has this property, then R is a special type of ring called commutative. 
kind of the next missing property for multiplication was an identity element. So second note, R does not have to have a multiplicative identity. It has to have an additive identity, which is zero. It doesn't have to have a multiplicative identity. But most of the rings that we'll talk about do have multiplicative identities. So let's define what that kind of ring that is. If there exists a special element, which we'll call one, but again, it's not the number one necessarily, so let's call it one sub r in the ring r with the property, so such that one r times a equals a and since multiplication is not necessarily commutative i also need to specify that this is the same as a times one for all a okay so if this is true then two definitions one sub r we could call it the multiplicative identity and we can call it that uh, but why stop there let's give it a special name one sub r is called um, a unity So unity or unity element for R. So the word unity in ring theory is just a shorter way of saying multiplicative identity element. And so then R is a special type of ring and so the the, the names that they come up with in ring theory tend to uh, be lack many of them are lacking in the creativity department a ring that has one of these unity elements is called a ring with unity so we just basically say it has one of these now here's the first place where you can see you can find different definitions depending on where you look in many places a ring will be defined so that it always has a unity. So in many, many textbooks, ring with unity is, is just called a ring. Uh, then I don't know what they would call a ring that doesn't have a unity, but we don't care about that for, for our purposes. All right. So next note. Multiplicative inverses. So first off, it only makes sense to talk about multiplicative inverses if there's already a multiplicative identity. Otherwise, what does it mean to cancel a multiplication? You have to get somewhere if you're, if you're canceling. Um, so in a ring with unity, And actually, let, let's make it a little bit more specialized here. Just to avoid a, a little bit of complication. Um, in a commutative, commutative ring with unity. I really wish there was a definition to abbreviate this. I guess we could come up with one. So in a commutative ring with unity. So here multiplica multiplication is commutative and there is a is a one element. There is a unity element. And since 
Yeah, let's just make let's just go with this. Uh, since this is going to come up a lot, th these types of rings will come up a lot. Let, let's just establish an abbreviation. CRU, I guess, commutative, commutative ring with unity. So I don't have to keep writing that. Uh, elements. Let's say it like this. Not all elements, not, not every element Not every element has an inver has a multiplicative inverse. Has a multiplicative inverse. All right. So in particular, zero, as we'll see, the, the zero element never has a multiplicative inverse. Uh, I just thought of one minor issue I need to clear up in a second. Um, but let me finish this definition first. Um, <clears throat> so in a commutative ring with unity, not every element has a multiplicative inverse. Those that do, or an element that does, if, if A has an inverse, and we're talking about multiplicative inverses here, we call it A inverse. A is called, and here's the definition that always gets everybody angry. I did not make this up. A is called a unit of R. So a unity is the multiplicative identity element. The, the one, an element that has an inverse, so an invertible element is called a unit in the ring. The set of units is denoted in our textbook U, capital U of R. Um, right. So one comment here, you notice at the beginning, I, I restricted us to talking about commutative rings with unity before I even address the possibility of, of multiplicative inverses. Uh, and that's because if I didn't, if I didn't have a unity, it makes no sense to have an inverse at all. If I didn't have commutative, we have to worry about the difference between left or right uh, inverses. If I, I might be able to find an element that when I multiply on the right, it, it cancels. I might be able to find a different element that if I multiply by it on the left, it cancels. I don't want to get into that distinction. So we won't worry about units or, or, or necessarily inverses for non-commutative multiplication. Even though it, it's still there. Like we, t we know about matrix multiplication, there are inverses and it doesn't matter if it's left or right, it's the same. Um, but we don't, don't want to really get into that issue. All right, the other minor comment that I always forget, let me just throw it in here. Back to the topic of the unity. It's a subtle thing. If we have one, if we have one sub R, that we have the multiplicative identity, it is not allowed to equal the zero element. So you could theoretically make a set that only consisted of the zero element. So just a single element set and, and that, that element zero R. We, and so zero times zero equals zero, but that doesn't qualify as a unity element because uh, we don't have a separate different element that works as a multiplicative identity. All right, so this is just a Subtle thing that I need to make sure to mention. Um, it's not really, we, we don't really fall into that trap, so it's not a, really a big deal. <clears throat> All right, so let's uh, get into some examples with the rest of the, the time on this video. Uh, 
And by the way, let me before I forget, if you ever have questions about things that I say in these videos or examples I do in these videos, you can you can ask those questions in a couple different ways. Um, you can send me an email about it, and I, I may be able to answer in an email. You can also, if if I do succeed in, in posting posting these on YouTube, you can, if you have access to the to a YouTube account, you can post comments and ask questions there. And if you do do that, then students uh, can discuss on there between yourselves about questions, and I can respond reply in the in the comments. Um, but in any case, if I do get several questions, I can also make extra videos that are simply to respond to student questions. Um, but we'll just work with as best we can with the with the situation. All right. Uh, so examples, we have all these definitions, hopefully you've copied them down and they're in front of you at least. Um, let's talk about some, some various examples of, of rings. So we have the integers with ordinary addition and multiplication. So we can add integers and it has all the nice properties as we know. We can multiply integers, it has all the usual properties and it also is actually commutative so it's commutative. Um, there is a unity, which is just the, the number one. Um, what are the units? So u of z. It's a question we can ask. So these are the units, meaning invertible under multiplication. Well. In general, if I want to cancel under multiplication in the integers, I have it's, it's basically division. So which integers am I allowed to divide by, in other words, and and get a result of a of a of an integer? Uh, which integers have their reciprocal is also an integer? Well, it's just two of them. One. One is its own inverse, and negative one is also its own inverse. Either of these, I can multiply. I, I can find an inverse for one times one is one. Negative one times negative one is also one. So either of these, I can find something to multiply by to get one. But like two, two doesn't have an inverse. It would be one over two. That's not an in integer. So even though it has an inverse, it's not in the set. All right. So we've got integers. Then we can do like the real numbers with the usual addition and multiplication. I guess this is now example two. The real numbers under addition and multiplication, it's still commutative. It still has the unity element of one. Um, the units. So I guess we, yeah, we, we've given this a name already. Um, under multiplication, the real numbers were a group, as we saw, as long as we didn't have zero. Zero was the only element that didn't have a multiplicative inverse. So that means in, in terms of ring theory, the units of the real numbers are, or is, the set we were calling R star before, which was R without the zero, so r minus zero. Um, and so I'll, I'll get to it later, I'll, I'll, I'll do the formal definition later, but when this happens, so as, as I mentioned, I'll prove this later, zero can never be a unit. There's when, when you multiply by zero, it turns out that you always get zero. And if, since zero is not the same as one, zero can't have an inverse, because multiplying it by anything will always give you zero. 
It will never give you one. So the best we can, when we talk about the units of a ring, the set of units, the best we can hope for is everything except for zero. So the whole set minus zero. And so in this kind of best case scenario, if we already have commutivity, commutativity and the unity element, if we already have this stuff. If we have the best case scenario for inverses, then it's called a field. Okay, so I, I will write out the definition formally later. But a field is basically the best possible type of ring, a ring with all of the best properties you could hope for. Um, okay, so we'll, we'll address that again later, but R is, the, the real numbers is a field. Um, similarly, I'll call this another example, but you can do the same things exactly for the uh, rational numbers. That's a Q, I guess. <laughs> so that's a Q. The rational numbers is a commutative ring with unity. It's set of units is everything, every rational number except for zero. So any, any fraction, I can take its reciprocal as long as it wasn't already zero. So Q is also a field. And going, so this is a subring of R, which is also a field, or a subfield of R. Going the other direction, a larger example than the real numbers would be the complex numbers. So this is another nice example. Well, I'm on four, I guess. The complex numbers is a commutative ring with unity. Its units are all the non-zero complex numbers. So the complex numbers is also a field. Okay, so these are, are the easy examples, the, the ones that are basically the, the number systems that we are familiar with some degree or another. They're all rings, and other than the integers, uh, they're fields. I guess. Uh, I haven't addressed examples of things that aren't rings yet. Um, Maybe let's do one of those uh, just for for uh, completion. I'm on example five. The natural numbers under addition and, and multiplication. This is not a ring. And the big reason is it's not even a group. Under addition is not a group. So to be a ring, you first have to be a group under addition, and you have to be an abelian group under addition. But this isn't even a group under addition because we don't have inverses. We don't have additive inverses. Um, the positive numbers don't, do not have their corresponding negative numbers. All right. I'm wasting all my example numbers on these trivial ones. Let's talk about on six now. Zn So Z sub n, I'll remind you what the definition is, but this is under mod n operations. So if you'll recall, this is the same Z in that we had from group theory. As a set, it's the integers from zero up until n minus one. So it has a total of n elements, um, but now addition and multiplication are handled modulo n. So once you get up past, once you get to n, once you add things and get n, you kind of reset to zero. So n's the same thing as zero. Uh, 
So we can we can go through an example with a specific and in a second, but let's just get the the uh, answers to our questions first. This is a ring. It's commutative. Um, multiplication mod n is still co commutative, so it's a commutative ring. It does have unity. The unity is one. Um, Pretty sure we used this notation back when we talked about Zn in group theory. The units of Zn this goes back way way back to the early part of the semester when we were talking about different examples of groups and trying to come up with, with new types of examples. One example was this the, the set of elements from Zn that were a group under multiplication. So that rephrasing that, that's that's trying to find exactly what the units are, the elements that have multiplicative identities. And the answer at the time, we, we defined it, we, we gave it the notation U of n. I'll remind you what that meant. It was the set of every number from this list. So we'll call it K and Zn, such that the greatest common divisor of n and k was 1. Okay, so this subset is a ring. Oh, sorry, sorry. This subset is the set of, of, of units of Zn. Let's, let's do all this with a specific n now so we can see it with actual numbers. So I'm not going to call this a separate example. I'm just going to use it to discuss the same example, but with specifics. Uh, so Z10, I guess. Z10 is easy to work with quickly. So Z10 are operations, for example, 4 plus 9 in this set. 4 plus 9 is 13, but we're working mod 10, so that's 3. Mod 10, you're just picking out the 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 ones place from your from your number. Uh, for 4 plus 9 is 3, for example. Uh, 5 times I don't know 7. 5 times 7 would be 35, but mod 10 that's 5. So we know how to multiply and, and add in, in this set. Um, so u of 10, u of z10, the units, would be those numbers whose greatest common divisor with 10 is 1. So the numbers from 0 to 9 who are not divisible by 2 or 5. So those are the prime divisors of 10, so that's what, that's what we have to check for. Things that are not divisible by 2 or 5. So 1, 3, uh, not 4, not 5, not 6, 7, not 8, and 9. So 1, 3, 7, and 9, those are our units, which means we can find an, a, an inverse for each of those under multiplication. So let's just do that quickly. Um, I need to figure out what do I need to multiply 1 by to get 1? Well, that'd be 1. What do I need to multiply by 3 by to get 1? Uh, well, 3 times, it, it should be something from this list, because if I can find an answer for 3, then 3 is going to be the answer for whatever, whatever I put here. Um, so 3 times 7 is 21, that's 1 mod 10. Uh, 9 times something equals 1. Well, 9 times 9 equals 1 because 9 times 9 is 81, which is 1 mod 10. Okay, so each of these has an inverse. Alright. Okay. So I guess well, we'll come back and say that later when we talk more about fields. Thank <laughs> you.
so let's, let's move on to the next example. Um, let's talk about polynomial rings. So because th this is, in some sense, one of the most important examples, the development of ring theory, the reason behind developing ring theory in large part was due to questions about factoring polynomials. And so the, the rings in question are, are rings of polynomials. So let's do a specific example first and then generalize. I think I was on example seven. Don't remember if I've used this notation already. Uh, but now it's the, the real numbers are here. So the bold phase R is real numbers. Then we put bracket X. What this means is, uh, let me just write in words. This is the set of all polynomials in the variable X with coefficients coming from the real numbers. I wrote coefficients. With coefficients in the real numbers R. Okay, uh, the operations are the operations inherited from the real number operations. Let me just phrase it like that and then show you an example. I mean, you know how to add and multiply polynomials, but I'll just clarify it with a quick example. All right, so for example, one polynomial would be something like 2x cubed plus 8x plus 7. So we're adding up powers of x with coefficients for each power. The coefficient has to be from the real numbers. So this is one element of r bracket x, r, r, r x. If I want to add, so 2x cubed plus 8x plus 7, that's one element. A second element would be another polynomial. Let's say uh, 3x squared plus uh, 5x minus 7, or minus 6, whatever. Addition is just about like uh, combining like terms. So we look for each power of x. We have x cubed here. We have 0x cubed here. So I add the coefficients of x cubed. I have 2x cubed. Then I look at x squared. I don't have an x squared from the first polynomial. I do have an x squared in the second polynomial, so I take that and it's 0x squared plus 3x squared will give me 3x squared. And finally, I have x in both places, so I'd have plus 8 plus 5x and then 7 plus negative 6, let me write like that, for my constant term with, with no x's. And so then when we simplify, we get as our result a new polynomial. So addition in a polynomial ring is just adding like terms, adding the coefficients of like terms. All right. Uh, similar, similarly, multiplication, let me do a quicker example. We had like 3x plus 4 times 2x squared minus 5. If this is going to be a ring, it has to obey the properties of, of distribu dis distribution. So this is is addition. It has to be agreeable with, with uh, the ring's addition. So if I distribute this element across this addition here, or vice versa, let me make make this a little bit clear. Let's use 
plus negative 5, so we don't have to worry about subtraction properties just yet. Uh, if we use the distributed property here, we have 3x plus 4 times 2x squared plus 3x plus 4 times negative 5. And then we use the distributive property again. What it comes down to is just how do we multiply monomials? So one coefficient with a power of x times another coefficient with a power of x. And then we're going to add those things up. Okay, so then the way it works is x is in, the, in these polynomials, x is just a placeholder that keeps, that identifies like terms basically. So the way to, to worry about the x's is we just combine them. We, we take x times x squared, that gives us x cubed. And then we take the coefficients and we apply our ring multiplication to those coefficients. Because the coefficients come from r, and in r we know how to multiply. So we do 3 times 2, which gives us 6. And then if we don't have an x, we get just whatever x's are there, x squared. 4 times 2 gives us 8x squared. And we've got 3 times negative 5 would give us negative 15x. And then plus 4 times negative 5 is negative 20. Okay, so that's all I mean by the polynomial ring uses the addition and multiplication that are forced upon it by the underlying ring. Okay, uh, let me do one more example for this video. And I, I want to keep the, the video links relatively manageable. I don't want to go the full hour and 15 minutes. Um, so I will pick up with some more examples in the next video. But since it goes with this one, let me let me adapt. So this would be, I guess it's still polynomial, but it's now eight. Uh, so it's going to be the exact same thing, except in place of r, place of the bold-faced r, I can put regular r for where r is any ring. So in the ring. R. And so on this set of polynomials, addition and multiplication will be defined based off of the underlying operations in the ring R. So this is like a sub example. We could easily, let me erase. Uh, so we can do it for any ring at this point. Let's just think about like uh, z four x. So this one, we're talking about polynomial instead of all polynomials, where the coefficients come from z four. So just to illustrate with an example, uh, two x plus three is one element of this. And then um, we'll say 3x squared plus 1 is the second one. So we're going to multiply this out just, just to illustrate how it works. Uh, it's, it's, gonna, it's basically the FOIL method, but when we multiply the coefficients, we have to remember we're operating mod 4. So we do 2x times 3x squared. We'll get x cubed, and initially we'd put a 6 there. 2 times 3 is 6, but mod 4, 6 is the same thing as 2. So it reduces to 2x cubed. And then we've got uh, outside, well, let's do inside first. 3 times 3x squared. So we get 9x squared, but mod 4, 9 is the same as 1. You don't have to write the 1, but I will. And then we've got uh, 2x times 1 would be 2x. And 3 times 1 is 3. 
So in Z4x, these, these polynomials multiply to give you this polynomial. And so my, my final result, all the coefficients will be in the same, same ring here. Um, but the operation of the polynomials is inherited from the operation on the coefficient ring. Right. Um, so like I said, there's, there's a few more examples I want to talk about. Um, but this is a good stopping point for, for this first video. I will momentarily start recording a second one and, and post them as separate lessons. Yeah, so more later.